Let's give the choir another hearty amen. 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 If God has been good, why don't you say amen one more time? Amen. If he's been real good, you ought to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. If you love him, say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, giving his name the honor and worship that it deserves today. I'm excited once again to be able to just be here at Andrews at the seminary, just encouraging you a little bit further in the word of the Lord today. Today, uh, as our time is expiring quickly, we want to go ahead and jump right into the word. And so I'll invite you to stand for the reading of the word, going back to the book of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and I won't read the entire verse as it has been read, but we will just put a little emphasis on Luke chapter 5. Uh, beginning at verses 1 through 5. Luke chapter 5, and we'll begin together at verse number 1. When you get there, just say amen. amen. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, So it was that as the multitude pressed about to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Today, I want to talk to you for a little while under the subject, reluctant obedience. Reluctant obedience. Let's pray. Father, I pray that in this little while that you would say much. Father, there is something that you need, especially those that have embraced the calling to go fishing after men to hear today. So Lord, I ask that you would, in the hearing of the word, cause faith to be multiplied exponentially. And so Father, I ask once again that you would hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end of our time, may Jesus alone be praised. Bless us to this end, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Let those that believe say together, amen. amen. And amen. You, you may be seated again, talking under the subject, reluctant obedience. You know, my friends, I ran across a great definition of faith. And, and this person defined faith as being willing to take the first step when God hasn't shown you the second step. And this type of faith requires you to believe that God knows the beginning from the end and that God knows the end from the beginning. This type of faith requires you to believe that God is able to see what's around the corner and that God doesn't just see in straight lines. This type of faith requires you to believe that all things work together for the good of them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. And the reason we so frequently abort faith is because too often we're only willing to believe to the level of our understanding. We're only willing to believe to the level of our agreement. We're only willing to believe to the level of our comfort. And the reason we don't see miracles is we try to have faith according to our feelings and not according to his promises. And, and what I'm learning in real time, my friends, is that if I'm going to abide in faith, I've got to get my feelings out of the equation. Because the truth is that faith does not always feel good. Faith is not always comfortable. Faith is not always enjoyable. And the truth is that there are times where my will will be in conflict with his. So there are going to be seasons where faith is going to require me to obey even reluctantly. 
And understand that this teaching is going to require maturity on the behalf of the hearers today because I used to believe when I was in your seat that if I was going to do something for God, that if I did not agree, and if I could not do it enthusiastically, it would be better for me to not do it at all, but that's not true. Because there are gonna be times where God calls you to go down a path where you're gonna have to travel that path even if you have to do it reluctantly. See, remember Jesus told the story of a man who had two sons who were instructed to go and work in the vineyard. The first son said, I will not. But after he gathered himself, he went into the field and began to work. He had a second son that enthusiastically said, yes, I will go. But he never went and executed the father's will. And the question became, which one did the father's will? It was the one that went even though he went reluctantly. And the thing I need somebody to get is that every step of faith in Scripture was made reluctantly. You remember when Moses' rod turned into a serpent and God told him to pick it up. Know that Moses picked up that serpent reluctantly. When Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, he went to the land of Moriah reluctantly. When Gideon was told to fight the Midianites, he was not enthused. He went into the battle reluctantly. Understand that a young Jeremiah responded to the call to prophetic office reluctantly. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane prayed three times for another option than the cross. And Jesus even went to the cross reluctantly. And see, God is looking for some workers that will not just follow him in word, but also in deed, even if they have to do it reluctantly. Is there a witness today that knows that everything in life won't always feel good, but there are going to be times where you have to do it reluctantly. There are going to be days where you don't feel like serving, but you will have to serve reluctantly. There are some days where you don't feel like working out. It's cold outside, but you've got to work out even when you have to do it reluctantly. There are days, am I telling the truth, you don't feel like praying, but the truth is you got to pray even when you have to do it reluctantly. There are going to be days where you don't feel like staying married, but you're going to have to stay in that covenant even if you have to do it reluctantly. There are going to be Sabbaths where you don't feel like preaching, but you're going to have to stand behind the desk even when you have to do it reluctantly. Has anybody ever been at a season where you don't even feel like praising God? Oh, come on and tell the truth. Where you don't feel like God is good, but you've got to praise him reluctantly. And what I want somebody to understand today is that sometimes your miracle is on the other side of your reluctance. Mm. See, see, let me tell you a quick story. I remember uh, when I was a junior at Oakwood then College, I was serving in the student body as the vice president. And I remember at the time, uh, the, the pastor of the university church was having a farewell service that happened to fall on a Sunday night, which was the same night of the NBA All-Star Game. And, and, and so what happened was they wanted a student representative to come and say words on behalf of the student body. Now understand, Pastor Dr. Williams, the president, was supposed to go but because the game was happening he dumped it on the religious vice and the religious vice was supposed to go but because the game was that night he dumped it on me and so I need you to know that I tried to dump it on somebody else but nobody else was foolish enough to take the assignment the night of the game and I need you to know that I'm walking down to the church reluctantly I'm putting my notes together reluctantly I'm sitting in the program reluctantly and somehow God blesses in the midst of my reluctance and even as I am walking off the platform the conference president of South Central stood up in the service and said what is that young man's name somebody said that's Debley Air Snail they said he said tell him to stay by I want to talk to him when the service is done now I'm so foolish I'm still trying to go to the game instead of talking to the conference president in fact one of my professors Dr. Molzak said 
said, what are you doing? Have you talked to the conference president? He grabbed me by the arm, took me into his midst, and says, this is Deblier Snell, the one you wanted to meet. I want you to know that because I went reluctantly, I was able to speak in front of a president that was going to hear what I had to say, and at the end of the service, he was going to hire me on the spot. Y'all didn't catch that today. In other words, I didn't want to go. I tried to get out of going, but God gave the miracle because it was on the other side of my reluctance. Are you hearing the word today? And so the word says to us here in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 5 and verse 1, we find Jesus here preaching. Now I need you to know that this story has more power than we're able to draw out in one particular message. But there are just a few message, few points that I want us to draw from the word today. Now here, saints, we find Jesus preaching against the backdrop of the lake of Gennesaret. And understand that he is literally preaching the people into such a frenzy that they begin to encroach upon his personal space. In fact, as the crowd begins to fill out, there is a disorder that has erupted. The ushers have lost control of the service as people literally begin to move closer and closer to the Son of God. And so in order to create some space, what Jesus does is he sees two idle boats and he decides to make them the pulpit for his sermon. And the first thing this teaches us today, friends of mine, when Jesus grabs the boat, it teaches us that Jesus does not ask permission. Does anybody else find it curious that Jesus just confiscates the boats of these fishermen without asking for their consent to use the boat? In fact, the word says that these fishermen are on the other side washing their nets and they're so preoccupied with work that they're not even giving any attention to the word. And before they know it, Jesus is standing up in their boats and preaching the gospel without their consent. Now, I'm not sure if you're understanding the tension of this particular text because we think that Peter's reluctance begins when he agrees to launch out into the deep. But Peter's reluctance actually starts when he allows Jesus to control his vessel without his participation or his consent. Now, now I don't know if we get this because too often we look at the text through eyes of those who are already persuaded believers. But I need you to get how much faith this requires because understand that as a fisherman, this is how he makes his living. In other words, the boat is how he gathers his income. And understand that it is a level of faith to let someone else have dominion over that which you use to earn your living. Y'all not with it today. In other words, I need you to get that this is no easy thing. see, See, I need you to know that one of the things I've learned is that people will be generous with almost anything except the thing that makes them money. In other words, if you know a carpenter, he'll let you borrow some milk and some sugar but come and ask for his power saw or his drill and and you'll get a whole different reaction. My wife is a photographer by trade. She will let the kids play with everything in the house with no regard or concern, but when they touch that camera, her countenance falls like Cain's before he killed Abel. Are y'all hearing me what I'm saying? In other words, there are times where my kids wanna play games with my iPad and I have to let them know that this iPad Pro is not a toy. This is how daddy makes his money. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, church? In other words, I need you to get like how taboo and socially awkward it is what Jesus does. See, see, friends of mine, this is like in contemporary times, seeing a truck driver at the truck stop and you just grab his keys and get behind the wheel. This is as insane as walking up on a police officer and pulling the gun out of his holster. That this is as taboo as walking on a plane and instead of going to your seat, Jesus just goes and sits down in the cockpit. 
In other words, I need you to know that Jesus the, allows these details to be disclosed to let us know that he is the sovereign God who exercises lordship in every scenario. He never functions as one that is in submission to any person or entity. He functions as Lord wherever he shows up. In other words, remember when he met Zacchaeus, he didn't say, Zacchaeus, can I come to your house? He told Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to your house today. Remember on Palm Sunday, he just found an unused donkey and sat on it and rode into the city of Jerusalem. And when he needed a pulpit, he did not ask for the boats, he confiscated the boats to let us know, friends, that as the savior of the world, he does not need our permission. In other words, there, there is something that he is wanting us to understand because some of us have confused the call to discipleship and what it means. See, some of us have got it twisted to believe that this is a 50-50 partnership when the truth is it's a hostile takeover. This is where we literally allow Jesus to have a monopoly over our hearts and our souls. And friends of mine, in any successful relationship, one of the things that's got to happen is that everyone must know their roles. Can you say amen? amen? You see, in this covenant, we've got to be clear that he is the potter and that we are the clay and that we've got to have enough moisture in our souls that allows us to remain flexible and pliable to be shaped after his divine purpose and his design. And we've got to get to the place where we recognize that Jesus answers prayers, but he is not a genie that answers wishes. In other words, Jesus disrupts the social order of the day when he jumps into another man's vessel. And understand Peter's first act of submission is when he allows Jesus to have control of his boat. As a husband or as a head of the household, it is a difficult thing to give up his boat. It is a hard thing for him to give up his vocational tool. But I need you to hear me on this, preachers. See, one of the things that shows Peter's faith is not just when he launched out into the deep, but when he allowed Jesus to manage his vocational tool. Okay, y'all didn't get it. What, what was the act of faith is when he stopped trying to dictate the terms of his work. And he just gave the terms under the control of Jesus. In other words, if he was going to be a follower of Jesus, he could not dictate the terms of his employment. He could not dictate the placement of his employment. He could not dictate how long he would be in a certain locale. He had to let Jesus be in control of his boat. And how many of us know that when you submit to the call of Jesus, that you don't get to dictate the terms of your employment. You don't get to dictate the length of your call. You don't get to dictate the placement of your call. You just got to say, Jesus, have control of the boat. In other words, this is a call to some of us because we are leaders and by nature we want to be in control. We want to dictate the outcomes. We want to be able to dictate how long and the when and the where. But Jesus is saying at some point, you've got to let me occupy the vessel and you stand back and let me be God. And what I want to just encourage you young seminarians to do is that as you embrace the call of God to maintain a posture of submission where you allow yourself to be led wherever God sends. In other words, do not get into the habit of trying to manipulate what church you're going to be sent to. Stop trying to dictate who the next conference president is going to be. Stop trying to iron out the details of when you're going to be in your next assignment because all you will do is frustrate your own faith. How many of us know that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death? And how many of us know that just because your feet are moving, that doesn't mean that you're determining where your steps are going to go? 
Okay, let me say it this way. I remember when my, my oldest son was a baby, and I remember we were getting ready to teach him how to walk, and there were times where he would learn to crawl up to the edge of the couch, and, and he would stand a little bit. But when we wanted to literally get him in the habit of walking, what we would do is we would grab him by both hands, and we would let his little feet just kind of walk and move everywhere he wanted to go. But whenever he was headed toward danger, we would redirect him and move him in another path. If he was going somewhere he didn't need to be, we would move him in another path. And the funniest thing is that he would be laughing and smiling and thinking that because his feet were moving that he was determining where he was going. But because daddy had the hands, I determined the direction he was about to go. And what I'm saying is your feet may be moving, but as long as your hands are in the hands of the master, he is going to ultimately dictate and determine where you're about to go. Are you hearing me today? And so Jesus says here, Peter, I want you to launch out into the deep. And see, I need you to understand that at this point, they are in the shallow end of the water. See, see they're in that, that part of the water where they can stand up. They don't have to wade in the water. They are simply washing out their nets. And so Jesus says, let's launch out into the deep. And the reason Jesus pushes them into deep water is that Jesus knows that faith cannot flourish on the shallow end. Jesus says, let's go out into the deep. And he's illustrating something greater about faith. He's saying, I want to take you into the part of the water where your feet can't touch the ground. He says, I want to take you to the part of the water that is so deep that you can't even see what's coming upon you. He says, I want to take you to the part of the water that is so far from the shore that you cannot swim or manage yourself, but you've got to be carried by a vessel that is greater than you. And Jesus gives this instruction to go out into the deep because your faith will never flourish on the shallow end of the water. And see, I need us to understand, beloved, that the miracles of God would never take place in the area where you can balance yourself. It'll never happen where you can manage yourself. It'll never happen where you can stand up on your own two feet. It never happens where you can protect yourself and guard yourself and soothe yourself. The miracle only happens when you are carried by something that is greater than you. Are you hearing me today, saints? And can I suggest, friends of mine, that this is instructive for our faith? Because, see, too often we live between this tension, the tension between what God promised and what we see. And the reason we never see what God promised is because we're too loyal to the shallow end. We're too loyal to that part of the water where we can stand up and be in control. We're too loyal to the part of the water that allows us to dictate the terms. We're loyal to the part that allows us to handle ourselves. And see, this is why it explains why we're getting what we're getting. The reason we keep getting what we're getting is because we're fishing on the shallow end. You realize, brothers and sisters, that there are only, there are certain types of fish that you can't get on the shallow end. <laughs> There's a certain catch you can't get where the water is low. There, there's a certain type of catch that you can only get when you go out into the deep part of the water. So remember that these are fishermen who are fishing with nets. And if they are fishing in the shallow end where they are dragging their nets on the ocean floor, all they're going to find are bottom feeding scavengers that are not fit for human consumption. In other words, if they fish on the shallow end, they'll find catfish on the shallow end. On the shallow end, they'll find spineless jellyfish on the shallow end. On the shallow end, they'll find clams and they'll find crabs and they'll find leeches and they'll find seaweed and they'll find algae, but they can't get a certain type of catch on the shallow end. 
And see, this dictates why it is that we're getting what it is we're getting. It's because we are fishing where we're fishing. In other words, sisters, the reason you keep finding spineless jellyfish men is because you're fishing on the shallow end. The, the reason, brother, you keep catching crabs uh, is because you're fishing on the shallow end. The reason your visions are minnow-sized visions is because you're fishing on the shallow end. The, the reason you keep on getting connected with leeches is because you're fishing on the shallow end. The reason your friends sting like catfish is because you're fishing on the shallow end. And what I'm saying is that you'll never catch the big bass. You'll never catch the whales. You'll never catch swordfish on the shallow end. You'll only get that type of catch when you get away from the safety of the shore. And do I have any preachers in this room who are tired of functioning on the shallow end? You're tired of a clam ministry. You're tired of a crab ministry. You're saying, Jesus, I'm not good being good enough. I'm not okay just being okay. Is there anybody that wants to see God do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can even ask or think? I believe in John 10.10 10, when he says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Is there anybody that believes Acts 1.8 that says you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But in order to receive it, you've got to get off of the shadow end and allow God to lead us by faith. Are you hearing me today? In fact, let me say it this way, it's crazy because I remember uh, when I was first teaching my daughter how to swim, she's one of these little prissy girls, you, you know my girl, where, where she wanted to learn how to swim, but she didn't want to get her face wet. And, and it's crazy because like what she wanted to do was she wanted to learn and figure out how to swim in the part of the water where she could stand up in the event that it did not go well, but in order to teach her how to swim, daddy had to take her to the deep end of the water. And so what happens is as she pushed the, I got there on the edge, I told her to push out to me. And as she pushed out and she began to swim, I need you to know that I backed up in the deep end because she was not going to allow herself to go down to the bottom. Now, as cruel as this may seem, we set it up in such a way that I stood at a length where she could not reach me, but I was still able to reach out and catch her. But I had to stand at such a distance that she didn't try to stand in the shallow end, but she just maneuvered through the shallow end and she didn't have to worry about how deep the water was as long as she kept moving toward her daddy. Y'all didn't catch that today. And what I'm saying is that as long as you keep moving toward daddy, it doesn't matter how deep the water is and it doesn't matter if you can reach him. All that matters is that you are within his reach, that the arm of the Lord is not too short to say and his ear is not too dull to hear are you hearing me today last thing this teaches friends of mine is that too often your miracle is on the other side of your reluctance now let's be clear like he was reluctant to to allow somebody else to take over his boat but i need you to get that a part of this reluctance is because the failure is still fresh remember what he says he was like man man master we we toiled all night it's not like they were just out there for a couple of hours this was not a leisure trip they, they were there all night long and he says we didn't catch nothing even in the deep end <laughs> so i need you to see what these guys are i mean they're at a place where, man, they, 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 they are over there washing their nets, which means we've called it quit for the day. They, they are physically depleted. They, they are hungry and famished, which means they are physically uh, uh, and emotionally exhausted. And the fact that they have begun washing their tech nets means that they're in a place of defeat, which means that we're not going back out there today. 
And understand, friends of mine, that washing the nets was not an easy task because it's filled with seaweed and algae and all types of gunk and, and the nets had to be cleaned sufficiently so that they would not dry rot and they would still have use the next time they went out. So cleaning a net was an arduous work. It was almost as hard or as much of a work as actually spending the night at sea. And, and here comes Jesus fresh off of preaching a sermon. He ain't spent no time out there at the water and he's saying go back to the same place you just failed and there's a part of them that's saying Jesus you don't realize we just washed those nets we just went through a lengthy process we, we've just kind of given up the ghost you mean you want us to try it all over again and see friends of mine the miracle doesn't happen just when they put the nets back down again and they bring up a large catch of fish. The miracle literally happens where they are tired, they don't feel like it, they don't want to, they feel like he doesn't know what he's talking about, it feels unfair, but they say, <laughs> I can see him wringing his hands. I, I can see him literally biting his tongue. He's trying to come up with a sufficient supply reply to help Jesus understand like the magnitude of effort that just went into a night of utter and complete failure. And as bad and as reluctant as he is, listen, the victory happens when he says, okay, Lord, I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I'm not feeling this at all. It don't make no sense. God, I don't even understand why you would tell me to go that way. But nevertheless, at your word, we're going to launch back out into the deep. Now, I need you to get friends of mine like how, how crazy this is. See, it would make sense if Jesus said, let's go to a different part of the lake. It would kind of make sense if Jesus says, okay, let's use a, a, a rod or a reel instead of a net this time. It would almost make sense if he said, let's just come back at a later part of the day. But Jesus says, I want you to go back to that same part of the water. I want you to take that same equipment. I want you to go back here in the same time of the day and I want you to go back to your place of previous failure and I want you to know that there's going to be a different outcome simply because it is the Lord that goes with you this go round. And see there's some of us that hate to return to the place of our previous failure. Because in your mind, I've already tried that church. I've already preached that sermon. I've already attempted that approach. I've already tried to forgive that person. I've always tried to be in relationship with this group. And the last time I was there, it didn't work out. But Jesus says, I want you to go back to the place where you failed the test last time. But because you go in my name, this time there's going to be a different outcome as Jesus is in the vessel with you this go round. See, the reason it failed last time is that Jesus wasn't in the boat. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. See, there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, I tried to reconcile the marriage last time, but you did it under your own strength. But this time, Jesus is in the boat. There's someone who's saying, Pastor, I tried to pastor these stiff-necked people and it didn't work. But this time, when you go back, Jesus is going to be in the boat. There's someone who's saying, last time I tried to discipline the kids, but you did it out of anger. But this time, Jesus is going to be in the boat. There's somebody who's saying, last time I tried to be a good Christian and forgive those who wronged me, but they acted more simple after I forgave. But this time is going to be different because Jesus is in the boat. And see, one of the things that, that Jesus is teaching them is that you cannot be willing to give up on the catch because of one bad night. He's saying, don't you make a long-term decision based upon a temporary situation. Why is that important? Because y'all realize that this miracle is not about fish or their daily provision. He says, from now on, I'm going to teach you how to catch men. In other words, he's saying that sometimes in the soul-winning journey, 
there are going to be some times where the fish are not biting. And you're going to be tempted to give up on that city. You're going to be tempted to give up on that church. You're going to be tempted to say, they, there's nothing for us in this place. But there's going to be a time where Jesus is going to send you right back to that same church. He's going to send you right back to that same town. He's going to send you right back to that same situation. And you have to be able to expect a different outcome because now Jesus is with you in the boat. Are you hearing me today? It's crazy because Jesus literally sends them to take a test all over again that they just failed. But how many of us know that sometimes the mercy of God really shows up when he allows you to take a test a second time? <laughs> I see a couple of my students from Oakwood uh, that were in my preaching class at Oakwood. And one of the things that they will attest to is Pastor Snell tries, by the grace of God, to be a Christian professor. So every now and then, if some of my students took a test and I noticed that the majority of the class did bad or a significant fourth portion actually failed the test, I need you to know that I would not just give them the bad grade, but what I would do is I would allow them to retest or take the test over again. In other words, I would give them the same questions. I would allow them to be tested in the same way. I, I would allow enough grace for them to be tested in the same area again. And see, the thing I need you to know is that once they took the second test, if they did good on the second test, I would not average the grades of the two tests together. What I would do is I would just throw out the first test altogether so that the only grade that stood was the grade they made on the second test. Is there anybody that's thankful that Jesus will allow you after you fail to retake the same test? But the good news is that he doesn't average the grades together. But our great God is able to throw out the first test and act as if it did not exist. It is why he says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white like snow. Though they be red like crimson, I'll make them white like wool. I'm not mad that he sends me back to the same place of failure. It's a retest. It's because he wants to throw out the old grave. He wants to wipe away the past. He wants to get rid of the evidence so that we have a completely new beginning in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that even as I close and we talk about being resilient. See, yesterday we talked about being resilient in life. But what today is about, it's about learning how to be resilient in ministry. Because there are going to be days, and we talked about this last night, the fish are not going to always be biting. And there are going to be times where if you're not careful, you will come to the wrong conclusion that maybe I'm just not the one. Maybe I'm not called. Maybe, maybe this is not for me. But there are going to be times where you, after, you, after they have kicked your head in at board meetings, Next month, you're going to have to go back to that same part of the water. After the ones you have helped the most disappoint you and betray you in the most painful ways, you would not be able to write them off. You have to go back to that same part of the water. After you preach for weeks on end in an evangelistic crusade where nobody gets baptized, you will not just be able to just say, uh, I'm done with it. You're going to have to go right back out into that part of the water. Quick story. Uh, what time? Quick, quick story. I remember I was uh, pastor in my small church in Columbus, Mississippi. And I remember we had decided we were going to do our first Revelation seminar. I was so excited. Dr. Williams I had gotten, man, a whole $500 from the conference for evangelism. And I was not deterred because we were right out of seminary. Talked to you about it last night, man, like a bottle rocket. So, you know, we had gone to our, our local office depot. We had some signs laminated uh, for our Revelation seminar. I had bought some little plant stakes from Lowe's where I would like staple our Revelation seminar signs. And me and my head deacon, we went and pounded hundreds of signs all over town through the ground about our Revelation seminar. And I remember I was so excited that there was just going to, the fish were going to be biting, that hundreds were going to pour into the church that night because we had done the sufficient work so we got there and I need you to know that all of our work 
and all of our labor created a grand total of about seven people. But I'm not deterred. I'm going to just keep preaching and the crowd is going to come. And I remember I preached one week and the crowd got smaller. Preached the second week and the crowd got smaller. And at least it stabilized with about four people with the last three weeks of the meeting. And I need you to know that the only people that attended this meeting is that the Bible worker from the church across town uh, brought two of her guests to the meeting. And it's crazy because after six weeks of preaching every night, and I had heard all of these evangelistic wives' tales, that if you just keep preaching to the end, hundreds of souls will come in the very last night of the meeting. But my miracle on that way never came. And it's crazy because at the end of the week, and I do thank God for that because heaven did rejoice that the, the, the people who came with the Bible worker from across town, they did make a decision. They did join the church, but the problem is they transferred out the very next Sabbath. And it's crazy because I literally went home, and I, I'm ashamed to admit this, that Saturday night, I laid down in my bed after six weeks of preaching, and I didn't get up out of my bed for almost a week to do, except to do anything except to go to the bathroom and get something to eat. And it's crazy because my soul was so crushed, my spirit was so broken, because everything that I heard happened for E.E. E. Cleveland and Henry Wright and Walter Pearson and Mark Finley, all of those that had it, that didn't happen for me. And so now I'm like, did I do the right, Lord? Did I hear you correctly? And it's crazy because Ellen White says in Christ's triumphant, she says that there are certain lessons that will not be learned except through failure. And it's amazing because this is the simultaneously the, the same year that I come up for ordination and the conference looks at my work and says, no, son, you haven't done enough. We're going to bypass you this year. And it was a year of utter discontent where I didn't think I had it, that maybe I thought I made a mistake, that maybe I thought I needed to do something else. But guess what? Jesus says, I need you to go back to that part of the water one more time. And even though I felt like a failure, that I was in obscurity, that it would always be that way. I need you to know that God has turned my entire ministry around so powerfully that I sit here today as the speaker and director of the Breath of Life television ministry and the senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church when just a short while ago I wasn't even sure if God could use me anymore. But the difference between those who fall down and those who stay down is that when you get knocked down, you got to be willing to get back up again. And you've got to be willing to go back into that part of the water where you failed the last time. And I need you to know that when you let down your debt, it may not make sense. You may not agree. You may have to do it even reluctantly. But your catch is going to be different the next time. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for that message. We want to use this time to ask um, a few questions to you to dig a little deeper in what we just heard. And um, I heard you mention failure um, a couple of times. And I was wondering, how does this message speak to um, the idea of failure being a sign that you have moved in a different direction than where God is leading you. Ask me the question again, let me make sure I hear you. Okay, I heard you mention failure a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how does this message speak to this idea or this concept of failure being a sign that you actually went outside of God's will or a different direction than God's will? Yeah, so remember last night we talked about how you gotta make sure that you don't misinterpret resistance. In the same way, you, you got to be careful not to misinterpret what you would perceive as failure. Now, one of the things I've learned is that certain disappointments, it's only a failure if you don't learn anything from it. It's only a failure if you allow the impact to remain permanent, if you allow the disappointment to leave its DNA on you. Because if you're not careful, you know, disappointment will change you into its image so that you become so jaded and so cynical that you lose the courage to even try again. But one of the things I do want to just encourage is to be mindful of some of the things that Jesus taught. So he says, listen, when you go into a city or a town, he was just like, man, if they don't receive you, 
He was like, you, you've got to kind of knock the dust off of your feet, and you've got to keep on preaching the gospel. And the one thing that he said was, you can't take everything personally. He says, this is not a rejection of you. It's actually a rejection of me. And so when you, because like one of the things about pastoring, oh, and I didn't get this last night, it is full of rejection. Like, do you realize that each week you're going to stand at the end of an aisle, and, and most weeks, you're gonna, the majority of the people are not going to respond to the gospel invitation. And it's going to feel like a rejection, but it's not a rejection of you. It, it, Jesus says it is a rejection of me. And so one of the things I've learned is just that, you know, one, you got to make sure that you don't take everything personal. And then you got to make sure that you learn how to leverage failures so that you learn something from it, that you grow from it, so that you don't give up on your call, but it actually ought to embolden you to try again. Let me, let me use one instruction. Anybody, anybody here a Laker fan? All right. Well, no Laker fans. All right, um, trying to think. Well, anybody, or Kobe Bryant fan, or you remember Allen Iverson, right? So, like, these are some of the most prolific players that have ever played the game. But one of the things about Kobe is, like, no matter how many shots he missed, like, he could be one for 35. Yeah. By the time he got the ball again, he was going to be ready to chuck it one more time. And one of the things I believe as pastors is you got to have a short memory. You got to have short memory for both success and failure. So you got to have short memory when it goes well. You ain't got time to sit down and ruminate in how good it went. Because guess what? You got to do it again the next week. And in the same time, you got to have a short memory over what you perceive as a failure and get ready to take that next shot when the ball is put in your hand again. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Okay. First of all, I just appreciate this. This message was directly for me. Thank you. Yes, I want to ask you a raw question okay. that I've heard from some dialogue sometimes with people that I talk to. What would you say to somebody who says, you know what, I trust and I want to obey God, but I don't know if I trust the institution mm -hmm. and I don't know if I always trust the conference. Sure. So the conference wants to send me over here, mm -hmm. but I don't know that that's where God wants me. What yeah. would you say to somebody like that? No, I actually, so it's funny, I have, actually have some, two, two really powerful testimonies in that regard. Because one of the things you have to decide is, who do you believe is more powerful? God or the conference? Who do you really believe is in control? God or the conference? And this thing I need you to believe is that God really still works through the faultiness of humanity. Like God will accomplish his will even through human folly. So let me, let me even share with you, maybe I won't tell both stories, but one quick testimony about how I wound up in Huntsville, Alabama, which was critical to my life's journey and, and path. So I was pastoring in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I remember before my wife and I built our first home, I reached out to the conference president and said, hey, you know, about to build a house, are you comfortable with that? Will you allow us to get three, four more years here? He says, listen, Pastor Nell, as long as I'm president, you're going to be there in Kentucky. Long and short of this is ultimately he winds up taking ill and has to retire within the next year. The newly elected president, the day after that session, calls me and says, listen, I want to um, assign you to Huntsville, one of the Huntsville churches. So the long and short of this is this. So we're thinking and planning for it to be Huntsville. Uh, so he had to elect. So essentially, let me go back. The pastor that I was going to be replacing, he was going to bring him in to be the conference secretary then I was gonna to go to that church in Huntsville. So the time of that executive committee, committee, committee meeting comes. So what happens is the name that he was planning to bring to be secretary, the conference committee did not accept it. They brought in another uh, pastor who was from Louisville, Kentucky to be secretary. And without communicating, they reassigned me to a church in Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm thinking I'm going to Huntsville. They call me only to say I'm going to Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm like, dude, what, what just happened? I've been looking at houses in Huntsville, planning to be in Huntsville, so on and so forth. And it's voted. It's done. So we kind of gather ourselves. We say, okay, Lord, you're in control. This was our posture. We spent part of that holiday season looking for houses in Louisville, Kentucky. So while we're there in Florida with my parents over the holiday, the pastor who was leaving Louisville to go to the conference office called and said, listen, Snell, I've been doing this secretary thing for about a week, and it's not for me. I'm about to resign and ask the pastor, uh, president to go back to my former church in Louisville. He essentially resigns from being conference secretary, goes back to his church in Louisville. 
the same uh, committee that rejected the, my predecessor to go into the conference office actually voted him to be in the conference office, and that's how I wound up in Huntsville uh, and ultimately over at Oakwood. And I'm saying this to say that there have been a number of occasions where I've seen pastoral moves and conference committees act in the most foolish way, where the Lord literally discombobulated what they were planning to do so that his ultimate will was able to prevail and be done. And so if you either believe that your steps have been ordered by God or you don't, you, either you believe that or you don't. And so, so God doesn't just order our steps. One songwriter says God also orders our stops. He orders our detours. He orders those things that go in a way that we don't see, think that they'll want to go. And let me just say this. There are places, and it's funny because when I got hired by South Central Conference, it's crazy. I can't believe we said this. There's a friend of mine, we both got hired around the same time. Our conference covers Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, and a strip of Florida. Now, it's crazy because, like, I remember I got hired. We, like, we were joking. On our way here to the Andrews, I was just like, yo, man, I ain't letting them send me to Mississippi because, like, I mean, who wants to live in Mississippi, right? And <laughs> if you're from Mississippi, don't be offended, right? And then I was like, and I'm not letting them send me to Kentucky because I had never been to Kentucky at that time. Like, I wanted to go to places like Birmingham or Memphis or Nashville, places where younger people want to be. So, like, this is what I say. I'm not going to Mississippi. I'm not going to Kentucky. And I said I'm not going back to Huntsville because Huntsville at that time, that's where all the old pastors were. It wasn't young energy in the city. But I need you to know my first assignment was Columbus, Mississippi. My second assignment was Lexington, Kentucky. And for the last 12 years, I've been in Huntsville, Alabama. And, and I, what I can tell you is that no path I could have chosen for myself would have been better than the path that God chose for me. So get out of the habit of being distrustful of the conference um, because this thing, so like when you read your Bible, you see men like Saul, you see men like Ahab. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that becomes clear is that when spiritual leadership functions out of sort, that God is gonna hold them accountable. So no matter what Saul wanted to do to David, he could not keep David from the throne. Amen. And, and so no matter what a president or a conference administrator may have against you, they can't keep you from what God ultimately has planned for you. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Pastor Snell. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right.